I'm the Emergency Preparedness Program Coordinator at the Massachusetts Office on Disability. Um, thanks for coming to the training. And as you probably know, folks who came to the training can leave with this emergency go bag and we have a bunch of handouts as well. I have little notes here in front of me because I can kind of go off and kind of forget where I'm at. So if you see me checking my notes, that's why. If you can't hear me very well, please raise your hand and just let me know. I know I can kind of speak quietly. Um, I have a presentation. I've never actually presented with it before, so you'll have to bear with me while we kind of stumble through it together. And yeah, does anybody have any questions before we kind of jump into it? Does anybody all? Say thank you for doing that. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm very passionate about emergency preparedness, um, maybe to kind of a strange degree, which is maybe why I got this job. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm always really excited to talk about it. So feel free to raise your hands at any point if you have any questions or if you need to get up and get a drink or go to the bathroom, there's no problem. Everything that I talk about is gonna be also included in these handouts that you have in front of you. So you also don't have to remember everything that I say as you leave the room or as the training goes on because everything important is in here. So this first handout that you have is just our, like, all the information you could possibly need for an emergency, and this is pretty much what I'm going to be talking about today. We also have a emergency communication plan, and this is an optional thing that you can do um, if you want to have, like, your kind of communication plan written down after we finish this training, if you want to, like, go home and try it. There's um, a few different handouts included in this other packet as well that are pretty similar to this. Um, so this is an option for you. And then at the end, I have an evaluation that I would love for you all to fill out or even some of you to fill out. It's really helpful for me and I really value truly honest feedback on this training. It's something that we've been doing since around 2007 and we're always trying to make it better. So that's something as well. So, like I said, I'm from the Massachusetts Office on Disability, and you'll hear me call it MOD for short. That's Massachusetts Office on Disability. And essentially what we do is we are a state agency that's focused on serving the needs of the disability community in the state of Massachusetts. And we do that through providing information, advocacy, um, guidance to state and local governments on you know, ADA compliance and different common disability practices for just state agencies. And we also provide trainings like this. So that's pretty fun. This program specifically, the Emergency Preparedness Program, is funded by state and federal grants. Um, it's been going on since 2007, like I said. And I basically go around the entire Commonwealth and I do trainings exactly like this. And it's very fun for me. Um, my goal is that everybody who comes to a training like this leaves feeling even a tiny bit more prepared for an emergency than they did when they came in. Does anybody already feel like they have a really solid emergency plan? Yeah, okay, great. That's wonderful. I think there's um, always something extra to learn, so hopefully you do. <laughs> and if not, there's, I think it's very valuable to hear the same information over and over again because the more that we hear it and the more that we solidify it within ourselves, the easier it is during a highly stressful situation to, you know, have an idea of what we want to do and what needs to be done. After Hurricane Katrina in 2005, probably all of you remember that horrible, horrible disaster, there were a lot of really staggering statistics that came out of the hurricane and one of those statistics was that 50% of the people who died in Hurricane Katrina were seniors and disabled people, which is like kind of unbelievably shocking when we think about how many people died during the disaster. And in response to that, all levels of our local, state, and federal governments kind of jumped into action to try and make sure that something like this never happens again. And in Massachusetts, there was a huge um, community of disability advocates and Massachusetts state workers and people involved trying to make sure that this never happened in our state. Um, and this program is one of, the re one of the things that came out of that. So something to think about um, when we're thinking about 
emergency preparedness and hopefully something that can kind of put people's minds to ease is that every municipality in Massachusetts has a emergency plan and they also have an emergency management director. So larger cities like Boston, um, they will have usually an entire task force of people and an entire emergency management department that can you know, manage this plan and make sure that we're following it as well as possible. But smaller municipalities don't necessarily have the resources to have an entire department. So often that person is the police chief or the fire chief and they're designated as the emergency manager. And these people are all public officials and they are all accessible to you. And if you ever have questions about specifically what might happen in Westford during a particular type of emergency, those are the people that you can go to and ask and they should be available to you. They have to be available to you. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so every emergency manager, um, their job is really to oversee this local emergency plan. And there's, you're probably thinking, you know, why haven't I ever seen this emergency plan? It is by design. So um, uh, the emergency plans are pretty much ever changing and being improved upon and looked at. And the reason that you have never seen this is because first responders want you to be able to respond to an emergency in real time. And what real time means is that they don't want you to have read an emergency plan 10 years ago and then tomorrow we have a disaster and you're wondering, I read in the emergency plan that there's a shelter open down the street. Like, why isn't this shelter open? I'm here in the middle of this emergency. And they want you to be able to get the information that's up to date and again, responding in real time. So there are a few ways that you can get information during an emergency. And one of those ways is by calling 211. And 211 is a service that is put on by MEMA, which is the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, which sounds similar to FEMA, which is the federal version, Massachusetts. Emergency Management Agency is obviously our state agency, and it's typically an informational service, so you can call 211 and just kind of get general information about what's going on in the state, but during a large-scale emergency, it turns into a real-time reporting structure. So 211 is one of the main ways that we recommend getting information if you need it during an emergency especially since during emergencies, oftentimes 911 is the first phone number that you would think to call. And if you're not in a life-threatening situation, it's just always best to try not to jam up the 911 lines for people who might be in a more imminent position. So you can call 211 and ask where the emergency shelters are or if you need to evacuate, if you're able to stay at home, what's even going on with the emergency I heard down the street that my neighbor said something might be happening and I'm not sure what it is. So that's pretty much the like number one resource that we would suggest calling. And then in addition to that, um, there are ways that the state can call us and let us know that an emergency is happening. For those of you who have a smartphone, you might have seen like Amber Alerts pop up on your phone before. They're really, really loud and there's like no way to get rid of them until they're over. You also might have seen it on your television before or popping up on social media. And this is something that the state can issue. It's called a communication blast. And it's essentially like a reverse 911 call. So they'll use these calling structures and they'll be able to call us. Other ways you can get information are through social media. So you can follow your fire department on Twitter or Instagram sometimes. You can look on their website. You can look on the Westford State Web or Westford City website and try and find information that way. Obviously, a lot of this is dependent on what type of emergency you're in. If you lost power, you probably can't look at social media. Um, having a hand crank radio that does not rely on power is also really helpful, and we have one in the bag, so that's great. Yeah. Any questions so far? I'm doing good. Okay. Great. Okay. So some tips and tricks for calling 911. So obviously we know that we can call 911 if we're in an emergency. No. Yes, yeah, you can text 911. Um, yeah, yeah, like the emergency. Um, yeah, there's the emergency section on your phone. That's not what I was thinking, but that's definitely something that you can use. The other procedure that you can do is called a silent call procedure. 
So this is something that all first responders are trained to recognize and know how to respond to. And essentially what happens is you're in an emergency and you call 911 and when they say, no, 911, what's your emergency? You don't respond and you stay silent. And the operators are trained to recognize this as the silent call procedure, not as a prank call or a missed dial or anything. And what they'll do from that point is they'll start asking you more binary questions, more like yes and no questions. So they'll say, are you in a safe space right now? Press one for yes or two for no. Yeah, so it's great. And it's something that's, um, I think, becoming increasingly necessary. We'll talk about some like other disasters other than like natural disasters, but especially if you think about a situation where there might be someone entering the building that's not supposed to be there or an active shooter where you can't necessarily speak out loud to the 911 operator, this is a possibility that you can use. Or if you're in shock and you don't know how to get the words out and you're really in a high stress situation or maybe you have speech issues or English isn't your first language, these are ways that you can kind of call 911 and engage in alternatives. <laughs> in Massachusetts, we have um, pretty high tech location, triangulation, I don't know, don't ask me the technical way that they do it all, but um, when you call from a cell phone, we have some great technology that can pretty accurately pinpoint your location. If you call from a landline, it's very, very easy for them to trace right back to exactly where you are. So yeah, if you call them and you're doing the silent call, they'll also be working on triangulating where you are at the time. But with that being said, um, like you mentioned, being able to, especially if, you, if and when you get connected to your local responder, being able to tell them landmarks of where you are or things that you're seeing, even street signs, like general street signs, especially if you're calling from a cell phone, will help them pinpoint your location even more because even though they can sort of find like a general radius of where you are, having more of an exact location when you're in an emergency is always helpful. Um, there are some helplines too that we have on here. If um, you want to take note, it's also in your packet, but there is a behavioral health helpline that um, is a 24 hour helpline. Yeah. I'm just going to say I brought the wallet oh. cards for the behavioral health awesome. helpline so you can grab them after if you need them. Awesome. Did you also happen to bring Sam's to distress? I did distress? Not. <laughs> cool. This one's a little bit more obscure. But this is also in your packet. SAMHSA also runs a disaster distress helpline. So it's like a more targeted helpline for people who have experienced or are experiencing disaster and are, you know, stressed or feeling confused or whatever could come up during a disaster. So something, some resource to note. Something in your packet, so this is related a little bit to your emergency communications plan. So something to think about when we're also thinking about who we would call or what information we could get from what numbers during an emergency is also something to consider is your emergency contacts that are close to you. And um, I'm sure most of us have at least one phone number <laughs> memorized for one family member or friend that's close to us, but I would like you to consider what might happen if you were in a high stress situation or in an imminent disaster and you were feeling shocked or confused or highly anxious and stressed and you couldn't quite remember exactly the phone number that you used to have memorized, which is very common and like a very natural response. I'm sure everyone has probably stood up at some point to do a presentation and completely forgot everything they were gonna talk about. And that's a similar response that we have when in a, in a disaster. Um, so with that being said, we always recommend that you have these numbers written down and we have them written down in multiple places so that we can find them and have access to them at any point during any like disaster or need. And we have um, a lot of papers and packets that you guys have with you now that you can write them down. I also have a few resources over here one of them is called a file of life. And this is something that you may recognize if you've seen it before. Emergency responders are trained to recognize this and know what it is. And this is just another place that you can put down emergency contacts and you fold it up and you stick it in the little packet here and you stick it on your fridge or stick it in your car or anywhere that you might want to have access to it. And so yeah, in addition to the emergency contacts is definitely making sure that your medications and your medical needs, 
your allergies, like little things like that. You know, I have asthma and it's so common to me that I always forget to tell people that I have asthma and that I have an inhaler that I need to use. So things like that. Um, and yeah, it changes. And that's why it's important to kind of engage in this type of emergency preparedness continually throughout your lives. And it kind of just like re-ups the interest in making sure that you're prepared and reminds you to do that sort of thing. Um, for emergency contacts, before I'll talk about medications a little bit again in a second, but for emergency contacts, we recommend that you have at least two people who are local to you, whether that's a friend, a family member, a neighbor down the street, you don't have to like the people who are your emergency contacts as long as you trust that they'll respect your safety and they'll respond appropriately if you need it. And then in addition to the two local people, it's always good to have someone who's further away so um, I have family who live in Washington State and I use them as an emergency contact because in an imminent emergency, it's often going to happen that the people close to you are also experiencing the emergency and it's nice to have someone further away who you can call and say, hey, there's something really crazy happening here. I'm not sure if I'm gonna have to evacuate. I'm just gonna pack a bag really quick. Can you call my sister down the street and make sure that she knows and that way you can focus on packing your bag and protecting yourself and getting yourself ready while your mom or your sister calls your other sibling or whoever and lets them know what's going on and makes sure. So three emergency contacts ideally, two close to you, one further away. Okay, a couple more things that you can do for emergency contacts. Um, those of us that have smartphones, um, iPhones have, and you've mentioned this, I think you were kind of alluding to this. iPhones have this emergency feature. I know you probably can't see this far away, but um, it's right down here in the bottom, and it's something that emergency responders can access without unlocking your phone. And the official name for it in the iPhones is the medical ID. And you can tap on the medical ID, and I have... I remembered to put asthma in here. I have my medical conditions, some like general information about myself, and then I have all of my emergency contacts, which are many right now. And you could also do that on Androids. Um, I think the Androids use a specific app and it's called the safety app, or I think the other one is like personal safety, and they all work the same. Um, and that's something that can be really useful too, like, say you were in a car crash and you're the only one really experiencing this emergency, the first responders can then, you know, open up your medical ID really quickly and find someone to call. Or the person who's helping you, who saw the crash happen, can come over and say, can I call your mom or can I call your sister and see if she can come help. Um, yeah, and we have, let's see, what else? We've got the file of life, we've got the workbooks, and then in addition to that, as we've already mentioned, making sure that your medical information is included in all of these things that you're filling out. Whether that is one singular medication, like my inhaler that I need to take, or if it's a whole list of complex medications. I'm reminding you guys that in disaster situations, we're stressed, we're probably in shock, and it's very unlikely that you'll remember every single technical name of every medication that you take. This is also something that you can get printed out from your pharmacy. And if your medications change periodically, just get into the habit of asking for a printout of your medication list every time you go and pick them up. And that way you can just have a current list with you or do it once a month. And yeah, it can be really helpful. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about shelters and evacuating in a minute, but um, especially when you get into a shelter, most of us probably can't afford or don't have the resources to have a month of extra medications on us at all times. And when you go into a shelter situation, if you weren't able to grab everything or if you just have one thing maybe that's incredibly important for you to have, you can always tell them and try to, you know, see if they have anything or if they can get access to it. But knowing that you're probably not going to remember the scientific name and the exact dosage and how many pills you take and all of that um, is a good reason to have it written down. When we're in an emergency situation, remembering again that we're going to be shocked and confused and stressed and all of that, we have a handout here that um, we're going to print out some extra after this. So most of you can probably take one home today. Um, 
and then there will be extra if you need extra. This is something called Show Me, and it's put on by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And it's essentially a way for you to point at symptoms or point at the date and time or the weather. An emergency responder can come in, and if you're shocked or if you don't speak English very well or have vocal issues or just for any reason that you can't communicate super well, they can pull this out and they can say, there's fumes, you need to, where is it, evacuate. Or you can point to it and say, take me to the hospital. And it's just a visual um, resource that you can use in an emergency situation. There's also an app that you can download, and it's called Show Me. And it works without internet, so once you download it, you can just have it on your phone. And if you need it immediately, you can just pull up your phone and use it. English minutes. OK, so back to our emergency communication plan. So we've touched on this a few times. And you know we've talked about having our emergency contacts and having our medical information in here. But something else that you might want to consider is what actually would happen if you were in an emergency. So um, it's like a big long note section here that you can type stuff into. And things that you want to consider is, um, you know, do I have to pick up my grandkids from school if an emergency was happening? Do my family members or my emergency contacts generally know where I am during the day? And if they don't, how would they find out? Um, do I have to be picked up from somewhere at a certain time every day? And do my emergency contacts know where that is? Questions like that to kind of consider, like, what actually would happen if this emergency was happening, you know, imminently. And other things to consider are, do you have safe meeting places for your friends and family members? Or do you know where the city's meeting places are? Um, which probably would be something that changes per disaster. So call 211 <laughs> and they can tell you. Um, but you know, even in like a personal disaster, like a fire in the house, does, does my family know where they could go to meet each other? And if there was you know, a fire along multiple houses, is there a place further away that we could go? So do we have two locations, which would be even better to have a plan that's you know, more robust? So these are just some questions to kind of think about and yeah, there's um, precedence for evacuation in Massachusetts and precedence to reasons why we think about these types of things. So in, what is it, 2018 in the Merrimack Valley, there was a fire. And you probably remember this. Um, I was not in Massachusetts, so I don't actually remember this happening. But for those of you who maybe are less familiar, um, a local gas company made a big bad error and <laughs> About 30,000 people had to be evacuated immediately. Um, I think one person died. Yeah. So yeah, OK, yeah. <laughs> you can all verify. And yeah, it's just um, it can be helpful to consider. You know, Nobody thinks that this type of thing will happen to them. But what would you even do if the fire chief came knocking on your door at 7 in the morning and said, you have to leave right now. I'll give you two minutes to grab a bag. You know, you have a grab bag. You could have extra stuff in it, but just kind of consider what you would actually do if that happened. During a disaster, there's most likely two things that will happen. One of them is that you'll shelter in place, you'll stay home. The other one is that you'll evacuate. So we're all familiar with sheltering in place. That's what happened when COVID hit. We were told to stay in our homes. Um, you know, in New York, there were specific times that people could leave and specific numbers of times that people could leave. Does anybody have questions about sheltering in place, or do you want me to go into any more detail? Yeah, I mean, that's just like a tough, that would be a really crappy situation. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, if you don't have Wi Fi, if you don't have power, if you don't have access to your phone, you just wait and you wait until you have access to that. Um, you know, if you have a radio and you can find a signal, that could be your kind of like third alternative option is to listen to a local radio station and try and hear like what news they're giving. But, um, you know, if you're told to shelter in place and you are completely without any sort of communication, you just stay there and you wait until communication is available, right? You know, another thing that might be helpful is having like your own system of communication between neighbors and people who are sort of close to you or, you know, adjacent to your emergency manager, especially in a smaller community. Um, 
having people who maybe like the neighbor down the street knows the emergency manager's wife and is close enough to her where she could relay some information to her and then she could pass it down, you know, like the phone chain sort of thing. Um, really con connecting with your community and connecting with your neighbors and the people who are physically close to you can be something that can also be a useful resource. Again, I'll say again, you don't have to like them, but um, it is helpful to have like, you know, community connection and that could be something also that you could lean on if the Wi-Fi was out, the power was out, the radios weren't telling you anything and yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to talk about just a couple more things. It'll be very quick, and then we can grab our bags, and I'll be done. Good? Okay, so there's three resources in your packet. They're probably towards the end of the packet. The first one is called Mass Options, and Mass Options is a service connector for people who are seeking aging and disability services. So just any services, they're a great connector. There is Requipment, which is a dur durable medical equipment reuse program. Um, and then there is also Massachusetts Equipment Distribution Program, which provides things like adaptive telephone technology, and they're also now providing iPhones. And I th I'm pretty sure that their, require their disability requirements are not super strict, um, so you can always reach out to them and they'll set up your iPhone and stuff with all of the adaptive technology that you might need. So three options, they are in your packet if you wanna look at them later. And then I just wanna to briefly touch on two other things that are really common threats that we experience that are sort of disaster related. And the first one is phishing, which we all probably have experienced at some point or another, whether it is a phone call from your bank or an email from USPS or a text message from some Amazon delivery driver about your delivery not being delivered properly. Um, so I just want to note that with phishing, something to remember is whenever you are starting to feel panicked or whenever the message is talking about something that has to happen right away, you have to click on this link in the next 10 minutes or you're not going to get your delivery. Or I get one all the time that's like, there was a $23,000 transfer out of your bank account, yeah. and I know that that's not true. Um, but, you know, anytime there's like a urgency to it, and especially anytime that you read something and you start to feel panicked, that's a good time to stop and not click on the link, not respond, hang up the phone. Because really, if, if there was a $23,000 transfer out of your bank account, you can find that information on your own. You don't have to engage immediately to the phone call that's happening. And you can take a time, you can take a minute to calm down and really think through. And something that maybe you know already, but maybe not, is that these phishing, I don't know, agencies, groups, people, they use a lot of like pretty modern psychology in order to put you in a headspace of panic so that you'll be more likely to click on a link or more likely to give them your phone number or something. And it can be really tricky. And I've almost been scammed once. My mom has been scammed like three times and it's, you know, it's embarrassing for me, but like they do use a lot of like very, very, I don't know, clever psychology to get you into the headspace so that you'll click and listen to them. So just be aware of that kind of thing. Um, and again, if you're feeling panicked, hang up the phone, don't do the thing. Just wait and calm down for a second. Okay, questions about phishing? Yeah, okay. The other thing that I wanna talk about is active shooters, which are you know increasingly something that's happening in communities and in our country and um, the recommendations that are given for active shooters are always to not engage, to turn down the lights, lock the doors, barricade the doors, get into a dark corner, stay quiet. If you are blind or you know, can't see very well at least, remember to turn off the lights, remember to take those extra precautionary steps, remember to just try and stay quiet. You can use the silent call procedure, you can text 911. Um, Engaging with an active shooter is the very, very last thing 
the very last resort if you absolutely can't get away and it's happening. Um, and if you're going to engage, we recommend that you really commit to it. <laughs> you know, don't kind of like halfway try to kick them out the door because that's, you know, probably not going to work very well. So any questions? Thank you. Any questions or comments about that? No. Okay. I think that that is everything I have. So a reminder.